This is the 17th season of Bass Talk Live with your hosts, Mark Jeffries and Matt Pingrak. BTL is brought to you by Lorenz, Bass Cat Boats, Apco, Duck and Fishing, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Bakes, Spro, Exo Lures, Yamagatsu, The Bass Tank, and Denali Rods. PTL, coming at you. Good Monday, everybody. Welcome once again to another edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where Matt and I are going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Matthew, how you doing? Well, I figured you'd be in a great mood this morning, considering Why the last that? two major tournaments have been one on. Uh, Carolina, right? No. Topwater? Yes. <laughs> well, actually, I, I, I'm kind of not really under the weather. Dude, I am feeling it. I'm a little sore this morning. What do you mean? I got the double dip yesterday. I got the COVID booster in the left arm and the flu shot in the right arm. They can do that at the same time? Yeah. You just have a cocktail of... Oh, my gosh, man. My arms are killing me. They better be wetter, better by Wednesday. Why didn't they just do it on the same arm? I guess they couldn't do that. I don't know. When's your next big bowling adventure? Uh, I'm trying to think. The weekend before Thanksgiving. All right. In Denton, Texas. So, but man, it was, uh, you know, I said, is it going to hurt afterwards? And he goes, yeah, you might be a little sore. He was right. Good grief, man. It is. Uh, what do you just work it out and after yeah, a couple of days it'll go away? Yeah. That's the only side effect. The I've tooth, had, everything though. good though with the tooth? You yeah. Got went it. back. He took out the Dremel tool, got it shaved down a little bit. I can actually bite now. So everything's good, man. Did you have trick or treaters really last night at the house? Did not. We do not have a lot of. Young, none, children. no one. You're in a neighborhood. No. You're in a neighborhood that I would think that would be very no. conducive to trick or treating. It's no. safe. People walk around. It's well lit. No kids. Obviously, if you as as if you have documented no well manicured lawns. <laughs> no, uh, no kids in this neighborhood, man. Very few. Very few. Yes, I notice if you see that. Yes, I wish Matt had the face paint on. I jumped on Travis Manson's. Dude, that was kind of scary. Listen. That this, was really scary. I need to I will say one thing about this and then we'll be done and move on with it. <laughs> so Travis calls me and I'm buddies with Travis Macy's. He says, you got any good ghost stories, blah, blah, blah. I said, Yeah, I could come on. So I talked to him about forty five minutes before the show. I said, What do you he said, What are you dressing up as? I said, Well, I'm not dressing up as anything. I'm just coming out. He said, Well, everyone's gonna be dressed up on the on the show. You, you know went all I mean? out. We had Bro- Brody of the Lake was on. He was dressed up. He had full face paint as a pirate. Travis was dressed up as a as a uh I, uh, not Dracula, as a, uh, what are the people who drink the, uh, vamp, not a vampire. Yeah. Vampire. A vampire. Because yeah. he is a vampire. Anyway, so I'm like, well, I got nothing. So I'm going in there looking for like striped Nike polos and stuff. I was going to dress up as you. <laughs> and it didn't. And then Kinder, my girlfriend, was like, well, I've got some cat ears from like four years ago. And I thought, oh, I run a bass cat. I'll dress up as a cat. Now, this is all like right as the show's starting. Then she's like, well, let me put some whiskers on you. Well, before yeah. I know it, I've got eyeshadow on. I've got the whiskers. She puts the tail on me. And then we go live. And I don't really look at it until we go live. And I realize maybe not the best career move. Ooh. But hey, it was all in fun. I was the bass cat. I went on. We told some stories. And then they got into the conspiracy theory. I told a story about getting chased by a sasquatch in alaska and then i was out of there and then they went on for three hours about conspiracy theories and stuff you so, wanted no part of that yeah but i mean listen my history of dressing up for halloween and did you ever dress up for halloween as oh when a kid? i was a kid yeah what did you go as uh gene simmons one year I'm trying to think what else uh <laughs> so you would you did the face paint with the black oh, eye yeah, shadow yeah, yeah, and yeah. all that that was like fifth grade Okay. Fifth or sixth grade. So you've done it. Yeah. So so all of mine, I Werewolf am, I am not a one. scary yeah. type of individual. Like, I've never been into the horror movies, the flicks, anything like that. So my... And I never dressed up as a kid for Halloween, never went trick-or-treating, anything like you that. You never went trick-or-treating? No. As a kid? No, never once. 
Dude, it's kind of so. I started face. in college, and then as soon as I was done with college, I was out off, and then I a, a couple times here. So I, I my my costume array consists of a, a Care Bear. Uh, I, I remember that a pink unicorn. I don't remember that. one. I went as a pink unicorn, and then uh, a Bass Cat. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. So you never got to experience no. rummaging through the candy in the pillowcase. No. Oh, sad face, man. I'm kind of bummed out on that. that so that's... anyway, we're back in it. Well, you could go trick-or-treating next year. Just kind of make up for it. Not, got any neighborhoods near Not your as house? the bass cat. I'm back to I prob- <laughs> I need to redeem myself for that. But anyway, thanks for Travis having uh, me on there. But... Yeah, that's that, that was kind of scary. What, anyway. What did AJ and Mark dress up as? Uh, that was a big Buzz Lightyear thing toy story really that whole deal they went through that phase and then uh thomas the tank engine was big too so when fun, they were little kids. fun stuff yeah they, they were never into the vampires and ghouls and goblins and yeah. all that and everything. anyway so all right well sounds like you had a good time last night uh did you immediately take off the makeup or as did you sleep as, with the no makeup? no no as soon as the show was over i said how do i get this stuff off and they she had these uh makeup removers and uh, yeah i want no 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 part of that anyway good show today man who do we have on uh we have alex redwine on one of the uh three 22 year old anglers who uh qualified for the bass master elite series this year he actually was in a three-way tie for the northern open and now that i'm kind of back in studio doing the scheduling i was like well let's do some theme scheduling right i kind of like it and so there's there's three of them and there's three 22 year olds alex redwine Jay Shakurit and Jacob Fouts, and they all qualified for the Bassmaster Elite Series this year. So I said, let's just have them all on on one week. It's pretty cool. Now, here's some crazy stuff. So obviously, they do three, 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 and three to qualify. So there's yeah. 12 Elite Series qualifiers. There's three 22-year-olds. But there's also, I just found this interesting, there's also three anglers. <laughs> I showed you this before. <laughs> this kind funny. of puts things into perspective. So Iconelli, who actually tied with Alex Redwine in the Northerns, I believe they had, what, 400 Nine, they all had the same number of points anyway. Ike fished his first North Carolina top 150 on Lake Norman in 1992, seven years before any of these three 22-year-olds were born. David Williams was fishing the Toyota Series. Back then, who knows what it was. <laughs> Ever start, whatever. In 1998, a year before they were born, and Joseph Webster started fishing the BFLs in 1995, four years before any of these I think guys those were, were the Red Mans back then. Yeah, probably the Red Mans And back then. the... Other one was probably the Strand series. Yes. So yeah. anyway, we have Alex Redwine on. He's actually at work, taking time from his work to jump on and uh, talk to us here in about uh, ten minutes. Yeah. And very interested to see. Uh, seems to be obviously has it together. And and I don't know if you know his story a lot, Mark. But, very little. Um, very little. You know, he's kind of tried yeah. to set himself up for this since he was sixteen years old. I did not know that. Actually went to uh, college for a year, was reading, a, uh, was reading an article uh, on Bassmaster about him that said he went to uh, Cincinnati for a year and then dropped out so he could focus on becoming a professional angler. He stopped playing baseball so he could fish more. His dad's been you know, dumping his boat in the lake for him since he was a young kid, and this has been his sole purpose. So first shot at it, he fished two divisions of it and went 30th, 12th, 12th in the Northerns. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it when he was on, but I was standing there waiting on my check next to him, and I was like, hey, dude, <laughs> you did it. And he was like, yeah, I have no idea what to do next. <laughs> like he's, well, so, I, so maybe we'll, we'll find out a little bit. We will find out uh, what, what his plan is to do okay. next. So. All right, a couple of things from last week that I did not mention, and uh, we kind of talked about it before the show. There was a couple of things that took place in the industry that was somewhat – News from a business perspective, uh, Gary Yamamoto was actually purchased by GSM Outdoors. They're into hunting and uh, knives and guns mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It's really their first venture into the fishing world. So they have purchased Gary Yamamoto baits. And uh, in the press release, it did say that Gary was going to remain involved with the company. So we'll see what develops from that. The other one was that Live Target was actually purchased by Mustad. And uh, not a whole lot of details on that, uh, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out with Mustad getting involved and, and obviously putting the money down to purchase 
live target. Now, I do have another question for you. Mm-hmm. Have you ever had body armor, the drink? Yes, it's delicious. It's actually a cheaper alternative. I actually start, I'll get two. I'll get the blueberry pomegranate for later in the day, and I will start out with the strawberry banana uh, for the morning, but I will finish it before I get on the boat. Therefore, there is no banana in yeah. the boat. I couldn't remember. Have they ever been involved with any kind of sponsorship? Isn't that pushing? a Coca-Cola? Well, hang on. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm not that going I'm aware down that of. path. I, I could not remember if anybody had a body armor sponsorship. Not, the top not of that head. I'm aware of. All right. It was announced this morning. You know, I go through my morning routine every morning. CNBC. You know, flip through some of the business stuff, and it was announced this morning that Coke has purchased Coca-Cola has purchased body armor. How much do you think? Man, they're. They went from what the heck is this to like everywhere. So I'm guessing it's got to be close to a billion dollars. $5.6 billion. The largest acquisition, purchase, whatever wow. you want to call it, that Coca-Cola has ever made. It's a lot of money. I've yeah. never had it. And really right now it wouldn't matter what it tastes like because I couldn't determine whether or not it was good or bad. Wow. Yeah, that is... Uh... $5.6 billion. So when I saw that, I was like, huh, is anybody... Got some kind of connection where they had uh, didn't uh, who had the who has the armor. who has the Coca Cola wrap on the Bassmaster Elite Series? I believe that'd be Micah Frazier. That is a distribution. I'm just saying, if there's any yeah. sort of correlation, that would be it. So yeah. we would be remiss, I, dude. I gotta I gotta read this some of this article from uh, Brent Crow, who's been around for a long time, fished a long time, and this is obviously his. Biggest win, the uh, Toyota uh, Championship. You know, they revamped it. They did a very top-heavy payout for the championship. 200000 if you win, an extra 35000 if you're with a, uh, if you're a Phoenix guy. Uh, and so he wins 235000 This is interesting. So he's very familiar with the lake. He ran all the way down the tail race. I just want to read an excerpt from the final okay. day. Right. Because you, you talk about how these guys win. Some guys win in dominating fashions. And this is like him waiting for the perfect conditions and it happened yeah. right so he talks about in the top half of the article on how he survived and he's throwing a shaky head he's mixing it out there's too much water running he's he he makes the final day on a tiebreaker over randy Blockett. okay so he goes into 10th and then he goes out and he smashes him on the last day he said i go out and make the first cast and had two boils under my bait and for the next hour it was just chaos for the next hour i either caught one or lost one on every cast it seems then i heard the horn and they started moving more water thank goodness even after they turned it up it took a while for it to affect our baits and it said by the time the current was running and the damage was done he said it what might have been the best hour of fishing he has ever had on pickwick came solely at the hand of a wake bait thrown on 15 pound test big game mono he said the conditions were finally right he said a top water is the most effective way he said i couldn't throw it the first two days cuz they were running too much water but that fall bite and uh, he said in his whole life it was only the second time he's ever got to fish a top water tournament up there on wow. his home lake so could you imagine that you know you're fishing for two hundred thirty five thousand dollars. you know what you've been waiting for you get there it is the day the final time where you're <laughs> like man if it's gonna and it and the first cast you realize it's gonna happen yeah that had to be an amazing feeling that's pretty cool and then to go on and just put a mega bag on the scales and win the two hundred thirty five thousand dollars double his career earnings with flw yeah that's that's really cool so a lot of guys i have said that he's a really good dude yeah um and we're super happy for him so i think he even said in there that he uh yes uh he said i'm not trying to make my living as a professional i make my living f- uh i make a living fishing and i like to fish and if the schedule suits me then i'll fish it when the championship was announced it was going to be here i thought Ooh, I got to make that. Huh. So that's why I fished that division to get to the championship. Being his home body. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So local. Uh, HFA. Yeah. Interesting. Said it, Did it say what kind of top water? Yeah, let me see if it said. It was a wake bait. Okay. A wake bait. I feel like a wake bait is one of those baits, and hear me out on this. A wake bait is kind of a mystery bait to me because there's all sorts of little tricks and tweaks and yeah. it works at a certain part of the country and you hear guys catch them on a wake bait 
but it's always kind of like the mystery top water to me. Yeah. It's hard to just pull a wake bait out of the package and, and go catch them. Like a wake bait is probably one of the few top waters that I have not, I don't think I've ever weighed in a fish in a tournament on a wake bait. Have you? No. Tape, no, you never thrown it at table well, rock unless in the you fall consider or, a redfin a wake bait. Well, yeah, a redfin is yeah. the original wake bait mark. Yeah. But do you do that fin, thing yes. where you melt the bill and then use the jointed and put the feather and a lot then of wire scrape it off and put a lot the of wire. bone on the side and then put the lead strips on the bottom and all that? No, I do a lot of the wire and the lead strips. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like a wake bait is the is the most like kind of magical mystery top water <laughs> like when it's, it's on really it's cool. unbeatable have you ever gotten bitten on a red fin or no that's what of, i said i'm not i've not uh, ever neat. experienced a good wake bait bite yeah it's a neat 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 bite very cool uh all right the remainder of the week did you mention who we're gonna have on yeah wednesday and thursday jay shakur and jacob faust okay. the other 22 I, I year olds know. who qualified for the elite series i was busy writing stuff yes. down over here uh it is november 1st and uh, hopefully everybody's going to have a good final two months of the year. And we are, we are very thankful that all of the sponsors that are associated with BTL are going to be with us in 2022, unless something just happens with you know 30,000 cargo ships running into each other. And <laughs> you know, I, I, you never know, but as of right now, everybody's back for 2022, including. A new one, of which I, I, I thought we might mention that they're going to come on board. It's a battery company. Pro guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what you use. Isn't I it? ran them this year, and I had I, I just had whatever they'd s- stuck in there for the previous years. <laughs> like, I'm not a super. So uh, I ran the AGM 31s, and I never had a battery issue the entire year. And, I mean, I ran them a long time because I fished a lot of summer tournaments where there was like daylight for 14, 15 hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I was very happy with them. Very thrilled. They've been around for over 40 years. They're kind of based out of there, out of the Midwest. A lot of the uh, Midwest guys run them. They got guys on the elite series and they're really kind of expanding it. And they just introduced a, uh, a lithium uh, this year. Uh, that's, that's affordable. And yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It's cool stuff. So we're going to get into a little bit of battery tra- talk the remainder of the year kind of we may have a show that kind of features uh selecting the right battery and stuff but they are going to be on board for 2022 so very excited about that all right man uh the sooners took care of business very very handily this weekend yeah the, the, brad's having a meltdown over here you're he? having a meltdown we're back we're we're good to go <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what the rankings are. I actually mentioned this, and I know we got uh, Alex, who's actually at work waiting, so we'll yeah. get to him. But I wanted to mention very briefly. Are we going to talk about the whole ranking? Let's save that. Yeah, we want to save that till yeah, after. Yeah, let's save that. We'll we'll. Because what if we did the fishing? We'll talk about the that. official like standings, <laughs> like the Elite Series standings, the BPT standings, based on like they do the college football rankings. Yeah. Instead of overall points, who's fishing the best yeah. right now? Yeah. Can you overlook a? Well, 98th place finish in Florida in January if the guy has three top 10s and is coming off a win, even though in the standings, if you just went on points, he'd be in fifth. What if you had a committee that was like, yeah, well, this guy, yeah, you can kind of look past that. That was Florida. That was Florida. He, he never really liked Florida, but look, he's, he's fishing really good right now. Let's we'll put him above that. the guy who won in Florida. No, we'll get into that. Okay. I have an opinion on that. Hey, by the way, folks, I want to remind everybody, the one characteristic about this show over the many years that Matt and I have done this, we do not jump down the rumor path. So until we get confirmation and actually have either a correspondence or a discussion with principals involved, we're not going to mention anything. So I know there's been a lot of stuff. So you're mentioning nothing about nothing? I'm mentioning nothing about nothing. I just want everybody to know we're not going to discuss, we're not going to talk about anything until we find out factual information. So from the source. We're going to go from there. All right? Makes sense? You ready to talk to Alex? I just don't like talking rumors. I hear you. It's not good. All right, so we're going to take a break. Come back with no rumor. We're coming back with Alex Redwine. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back. Elite 
DFS puts the full range of Lowrance fish finding tools at your fingertips. Find fish with active imaging 3-in-1 with Fish Reveal. Target fish with active target live sonar and watch fish react to your lure as it happens. Built-in C-Map contour plus charts make it easy to find key fishing areas. But best-in-class charts and powerful sonar is only the beginning. It's easy to build your fully networked FS system, from sonar and waypoint sharing to controlling the ghost trolling motor and power poles. Lawrence Elite FS, targeting fish just got easier. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, its new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Bass Cat. Feel the rush. There's one. You know what works. Now you need a bunch of them so you don't run out on your next fishing trip. The Big Bite Pro Packs feature 25 baits per pack at a price far below that of having to buy five packs of regular baits. Now the Pro Pack has a big brother, the Mega Pack. The Mega Pack features 100 of your favorite baits. With these, one bag is usually plenty to get through the day. It helps me stay organized, helps me save money, helps me catch more fish. Combining one of the most popular hook styles with Gamakatsu's beefier Superline offering, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend delivers the strength necessary to target big fish in heavy cover. Well suited for braided line and heavier fluorocarbon, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend is built using stronger Superline wire that allows anglers to easily fish a finesse worm around heavy cover. The round band offers a larger bite area, perfect for any worm presentation, while increasing your hookup ratios. The newly enhanced Z-Band holds your plastics on the hook longer, reducing the number of pull-offs and reducing damage to plastics. Available in 2-aught, 3-aught, 4-aught, and 5-aught, this is the most durable worm hook, designed for heavier lines that hold your bait on longer. So, you're looking to buy fishing electronics, huh? Are you also looking for true experts to help guide you through it? Well, at the Bass Tank, you've come to the right place. We are live forward-facing sonar pioneers with thousands of hours spent learning through winning trophies, cashing checks, and just having fun. Whatever brand you need, we have it. We offer free shipping and we have two financing options available. Our experts are here to help you. Call us today or visit thebasstank.com. Preparation is key to success. And that preparation starts well before you ever hit the water. You're only as strong as your connection to the fish. And your line is that critical connection. Confidence in your line every minute of every day on the water is a necessity. And failure, it's not an option. Sunline makes the fluorocarbon, nylon, and braided lines to give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. All right, we are back. Kicking off the week on a Monday. Mark and Matt in studio. And it is time to go to our special guest. And uh, let's bring him in here. I can find my mouse. Where'd the mouse go? Okay, there it is. You got new batteries in that. Alex, thing. how you doing, man? Good, good. Just at work. Uh, I was able to get away for a little bit. <laughs> All right. Very nice, man. Thanks for taking time out. But it's got to be an exciting time for you, man. Yeah, it for sure is. It's it slowly started to, to set in. It happened back in earlier in September. Um, but it's, um, it's it's been cool to try to figure this whole professional bass fishing thing out. <laughs> All right, so you're sitting in your truck. What is your current job? I work at the Cadillac dealer. Uh, I'm going uh, you know, to cars for them. So, but it, I guess. What we, just happened? I don't know. We lost the we lost the audio for a brief moment there, and then it caught back up. Here, Jeffries is going to hit a couple buttons right here. Adjust that. Okay. Click that. Are you back now? Yeah, can you hear me? 
All right, yeah, we're we got good. you. All right, I'm going to ask that again because we got it like in a reverse it order. It was weird. <laughs> it sounded a little bit like Pig Latin. <laughs> so what what is your job as a 22-year-old right now? Uh, I work at a, a Cadillac car dealership, and I detail and clean up cars for them. So it's not the most glamorous job, but it's enough to pay for some, some entry fees and some fish and tackle. So what did the what did the Cadillac what did your boss at Cadillac say when you're like, hey man, I just made the top fishing tour of the country here. Like, are you going to continue to work there? What's the? I mean, are they cool with it? Does anyone fish there? Do they understand the magnitude of what you just accomplished? Uh, they kind of understand. Like this past year, I had to give them. Or my boss is like a nice guy enough. Where like this past year, I took off. I don't know, a total of probably three months out of the year, but. They understand what I'm doing, and they're they're fully supportive of it, which is cool. And yeah, they but they're not. There's some people that fish at the car dealership, but they they don't really understand exactly the magnitude of what's going on. But I'm able to. It's been nice enough to at least have that kind of free schedule where I'm able to do my own thing and also still come back and make a couple bucks. Now the real question is: Is he going to get to tow with an Escalade? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm just it. saying there's an opportunity there. Uh, yeah, there is, but I thought about it too, but I'd really have to sweet talk somebody into letting me do that. But that and the whole Listen, car industry, the whole car industry, there's not even escalades available. You're a professional angler now. Your job is to sweet talk people into allowing you to go fishing for the next thirty years. Wow. Wow. <sighs> All right, so what is the history behind you getting to this point, Alex? I mean, where did you start out? When did you decide, this is definitely what I want to do? Yeah, so my dad is the one I owe a lot of credit to. He he fished a lot of, like, regional and local tournaments throughout the years. And then when I was born, um, he's just always taking me fishing. We have, a we have, like, a neighborhood, like, lake in our backyard that, like, every day after school I'd go and fish and catch whatever I can. Um and then when I reached a certain age, I got started in like the tournament aspect of things. And when I was like 11 or 12, I joined the youth, uh, youth local fishing club here in Cincinnati. Um, and that, that got me like into the, instead of just fun fishing, it got me into what competitive fishing is like and that. And I've also, I've always, always played sports, uh, through my younger years. So I've always been competitive and, and I like lo- grew up fishing, loved fishing. Then I started getting into the competitive side of things and, Ever since then, I just got just got excited for it and and just hooked on it. Um, and then so I went through uh, youth fishing, and then I kind of started to to dwindle out the whole baseball and sports thing. And I just kept enjoying more and more about fishing and just the aspect of of capturing five bass. And and then it just kind of built from youth fishing uh, to high school fishing. Uh, dabbled a little bit in college fishing and then uh, i just been fortunate enough where my dad and parents have supported me so much and i've had access to a bass boat where um, as soon as i turned 15 and 16 and i or had my temporary license and my driver's license um my dad kind of like loosened up the chain a little bit and he just said go fishing even more and and then i went fishing every opportunity i could and eventually i just started kind of started working my way up through college fishing bfls and doing some co-angler stuff and then and then um my dad was my dad was like well do you want to do you want to do you want to take a crack at this and i was like yeah i want to take a crack at this and he's like okay well here you go go sign up for last year i did some toyota series and and one division of the opens and and i was like and so i was 21 20 21 years old last year doing doing some of these and I got my teeth kicked in in some tournaments, but I also learned a lot. And this year I kind of understood what I need to do and what I need to not do and uh, what it takes to fish bigger tournaments. And then somehow here I am, I guess. So uh, I talked with you a little bit kind of off air about this. You finished 30th, 12th, and 12th in the Northerns. It was a three-way tie for it. But it sounds like based on how you caught them in all three, you kept it really simple and made good decisions and executed. So just kind of walk us through your three finishes um, in those events. Like, I mean, when I was talking to you, I was like, huh, yeah, that, that makes 
perfect sets. Like you just, it seems like for someone who's so young, you did a really good job of not overthinking it and trying to fish outside of your comfort zone, which we hear so many of the established pros say, find what you're comfortable in. Don't spread yourself out too thin and just go do what you do. And it sounds like you did that in all three of those Northerns. Yeah, I did keep it simple. None of the practices for all three of the Northerns, I was, I would ever say that I was like on them. Um, on all three events, between all three events, I caught them, I think, on only two or three baits through all those events. But even on the James River, I caught them uh, flipping. And up north, I caught them on a drop shot. But, yeah, I kept it super basic. And, like I said, I was never on them in practice. And I kind of just I kind of just went in almost to the mentality of, okay, I'm going to try to survive this event. And I guess me somehow having that mentality of, oh, I'm just going to survive it somehow worked out in a way and and you experienced the map but like each of the tournaments like the weather was none of the conditions were right in each of the northern opens like uh like on the james river we had there was like some sort of weird wind that made the tide shoot out like a super tide yeah super tide and um it messed a lot of people up that were making that long run to the, the the chick um but it didn't have an effect on me and then oneida we had that crazy wind that blew from one it just blew like crazy in new york mm-hmm. like it always does and i don't know it's just a weird thing where like that me having me like oh i'm just gonna survive this tournament and it just ended up it just ended up all falling into my favor i guess and uh, but like were you planning oh there's gonna be a super tide i need to find something that's not <laughs> affected by tide or was it just like after no. the tournament you were like oh, that didn't affect me and it affected everyone else. And like at Oneida, I'm out there eating waves on Shackleton and you're like, oh, that wind didn't affect me at all. Like, did it just kind of happen or was those yeah. were those calculated decisions well beyond your years that you saw what was going to happen and you made a, a decision to, to take that out of play? It wasn't in my plan at all. Like, I didn't know what a super tide was. I came back from the second day of, <laughs> at, J- at James River. The first day I was in 60th place, and then the second day I moved up to 30th place. And like coming into way, and I was like, "Oh man, like I, I don't think I'm gonna cut a check. I think I'm I'm gonna not do the best." And I get back, and they're like, "Man, like you caught them good." And I was like, "What do you mean? Like I I didn't do that good?" And they're like, "No, everyone got messed up from that super tide." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" Um, <laughs> and the blah blah blah, and then. I ended up getting 30th place in that at Oneida. I, like in the, it, the wind didn't start blowing. The first hour of each of the days at Oneida, the wind was calm. And then after that first hour, it was like tsunami. So, yeah, you said it, there's <laughs> waves everywhere. Um, but I caught a few in the, in the morning and then I had a backup plan, I guess a survival plan to go like into a bay and up a creek. It's where I thought that I might be able to catch a couple of largemouth. And I ended up doing that and caught a limit of largemouth and I didn't know what was going out on the main lake. I just thought, oh, I'm going to survive in this creek. And I come out of the creek, and there's five foot or five or six footers, and I'm like, oh, I'm glad I'm not out here. <laughs> um, uh, wow. Yeah. So, wow. So then so, I even talked to you at Thousand Islands. Did you – remind me, I think this is you was talking like you were running over something, and you saw your – you were looking at your graph, which is a veteran move, looking at your graph while you're running, but at a low speed, and you saw it like jump up or something different and you weren't on anything and you spun back around and it was like the last day of practice and you were like big one, big one, big one. And you're like, I guess I'll just fish here. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, or, <laughs> no, Ontario is just, so, I was out on Ontario out on the lake and like, it's so big and there's so much water to cover. So you don't know where all like the good rocks are, good areas. And, and some of the contours on the map don't look the most appealing. So I was just, I was just running. I was going I was going to go check out somewhere like two miles this way and I was just running and then I was in like 25 foot of water and I see like this little spike on the sonar and I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. And then so I spin back around and started idling and like out in the middle of like nowhere, like there's no contours on the map that look appealing at all that you would scan over. But it was just like this half mile area of just rock veins and rock piles and boulders. And once I found that, like I never saw another boat around there or nothing and then in practice, I caught a couple of fish, and and I was like, oh, the wind's going to blow in the tournament. Hopefully these fish stay here. I guess I didn't find anything in the St. Lawrence River, so that was my only plan. I guess I'll go back, float around out here and hopefully somehow catch a couple big ones. And then I floated around out there, and I guess I caught a couple big ones. I don't know. <laughs> I'm serious. I told you. Wow. Wow. All right, Alex, what what is your game like on the southern 
bodies of water? In other words, it, it, do you feel that your game is where it needs to be to compete on the southern Chickamauga, yeah, Pickwick, stuff like that. Kentucky Lake, Florida, that type of stuff. Yeah, what's your thoughts? Uh, I'm most intrigued, or one of the events is in June on Pickwick, which is going to be uh, most likely like a majority of the people that do well, not saying all of them, is going to be focused on that offshore, um, like ledge fishing, schools of fish, yeah. whatever. That's something that I'm not the most familiar with. Like me growing up in Ohio, like I'm used to those those grinder events, the ones that you just put your head down and you hope for five bites, whether they're 12 inches or 14 inches or a six pound limit. You, and if you come back with a six pound limit in Ohio, you got your head high. You're like, here, you're doing good. Um, but I, I'm just used to those grinder events where bites are sometimes not the most plentiful. And but I, I don't know what I'm in for. Like I've spent, I've been on a handful of lakes in the South and Florida, um, but it's one of those where I'm just gonna have to go in it, go into an event with just kind of just an open mind and not like not fall into. Oh, if I go to Pickwick, I have to fish ledges. I have to fish offshore. I'm gonna get, just gonna go into it and have an open mind and just kind of fly by the seat of my pants. I feel like that's what I've I've done throughout the years and just not listen to any sort of superstition or pre notion or whatever and just kind of roll with it. All right, that's pretty cool. I like it. That's what Matt did. He just kind of rolled with it when he was at Pickwick. Yeah. Yeah, has, has have you talked to <laughs> Joe, Joe Thomas, Bill Lowen, Charlie Hartley, any of these Ohio guys? I mean, it's kind of like a a little small group of Ohio guys. I lived in Cincinnati for a year. I played hockey for the Cincinnati Cobras. I fished a farm pond. It took me forty five minutes to get there from my billet house to that. I mean, you got a river there. It's not like a mecca. We we know all about the Ohio River and stuff. But have you if, has anyone reached out to? Have you talked to anybody? Any of the uh, elite series pros or anything from that that are kind of like, hey man, here's what to expect. Uh, I've talked to just a couple people. I like I've spoken to like Buddy Gross on the phone. But yeah, Ohio's kind of like an oddball state. I mean, yeah, there's some really good fishermen like the Hunter and Fletcher and Bill Lowen and Charlie Hartley. Um, but it's kind of like Ohio's kind of like just an oddball state. Like no one, no one knows. I mean, I guess you, you have Lake Erie, but like Ohio's not known mm-hmm. for anything. Um, but yeah, it will be really cool representing Ohio. Um, but as far as like friends on like the tour and the elites like i don't really have i don't know anybody honestly like i'm just kind of being thrown out there and and i'm sure i'll make friends and everything but but are you gonna room with anybody as of right now you fly solo so far i'm flying solo like i said i guess i gotta i gotta make friends (laughs) Um, (laughs) (laughs) you could just like throw a party or something at the first event alex redwine invites you invites you to the motel six (laughs) <laughs> oh man! For, for drinks and cocktails, following the first day of practice. No, but you're all in. I, I yeah. You know, I mean, I, you're a hundred percent doing it. You're yeah. all in. There's no questions in your mind. Yeah, I'm for sure, and I'm like, like right between now and when I got to leave for the St. John's after the first of the year. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to get as make as much money here as I can, so I can at least try to get by this first year. Because you're not guaranteed. Like, you can either for next year. Like, there's no guarantee that I'm going to go out there and make a bunch of money. Um, so I'm just trying to save up as much money as I can and at least get, at least survive this first year and whatever happens after this year, that'll, that might be the, the tale of how, like, is this going to work out or is it, am I going to have to rethink things or what? <laughs> Do you have a boat wrap? Do you know how you're going to wrap your boat yet? Uh, right now I'm in the process of, um, getting people, uh, getting in like relations with companies and stuff. Um, it's something that like I, I haven't done up to this point. I haven't like experienced the marketing and the, and the business side of the fishing industry. Like my whole life, I've just been focused on fishing. And I thought, oh, like eventually I'll worry about the whole sponsor stuff and everything like that. But right now, um, I'm in the works of things. I'm trying to figure things out and get an understanding of what all is going on on business side and sponsorships and et cetera. All right, man. I'm going to ask him because this is a guy who is obviously in the trenches doing what we talk about all the time, the young anglers that qualify for the Elite Mm -hmm. Series. Would it help you out or would it be detrimental to you if you had six months to put your package together from a sponsorship standpoint and then hit the Elite Series the following year? Would that be something that you would like rather than being rushed, 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 trying to do what you have now? But let's say if you... 
if you qualified for the Elite Series in at the end of June, and then you have the remainder of the year to put together a package for the following year, is that something that would be appealing to you? I feel like it would be a lot more beneficial, yeah. Um, like, the Northern Division was one of the first divisions to, like, wrap up. It's like I Mid-September? Had yeah, I had yeah. more time to um, kind of, like, prepare myself or at least try to prepare myself in some of these other divisions. But, yeah, and as I'm starting to figure out with these um, big companies and stuff, a lot of those companies, they do all their, um, like, their finances and their um, their budget for the year, like, this, like around, like, right now. Like, um, so these people, like myself, like, if I was to contact the company and, like asking for money or some sort of relationship or sponsorship, they, a lot, some of them were like, yeah, we've already done our budget for 2022. Um, so that's kind of been tricky to figure out. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it would be, I think it'd be very beneficial to have more yeah. time to prepare because I agree. Fishing is, uh-huh. it's not, it's not just fishing. It's also, it's also a business. There's also a business yeah. side to, to fishing. It sounds like it just talking to you, like you're like a little bit ahead of schedule. <clears throat> I like, I mean, know. it wasn't like you were like, I'm 100%, like, I'm ready to do this. You're like, I- I'm working my way into it. This is what I want to do for my career. And now it's like the opportunity came, like, right out of the gates. Fair yeah. assessment? Or, or I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, you could have gone out and been like, I'm going to beat all these guys fish in the top three <laughs> in the first year. But, but I mean, dude, like, it's – it. I remember talking to you. You're like, holy cow, I just did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely weird, and it seems like – very ahead of schedule of what I did. And I don't know, like this is last year I did a division of the open from this year. Um, yeah, it seems weird. And I almost feel like somewhat like undeserving of like an opportunity to like people, people work their whole lives and fishing the opens for countless of years. And, and it's like, how did I just hop in here and somehow, somehow make it? Um, but yeah, it's, it's just been a big, eye opener to understand the whole business side that's going to be the biggest learning curve for me is understanding what i what i have to do off the water to prepare for when i'm on the water yeah yeah hey you know there's a dude in ohio that that you might want to talk to every now and then he has a show on btl it's called day four his name's frank scalish been around a while (laughs) uncle frank (laughs) uncle frank (laughs) yeah yeah are, uh, what type of fisherman are you then? Are you a, a Great Lakes nor- uh, northern guy, light line? Are you a, a power fisherman? Are you, are you a homebody? Do you cover a lot of water? I mean, it, it was kind of like you said, a unique situation with how it went down in the northerns. But if you had to pick your comfort zone, what is that? Uh, I feel like, I, like in Ohio, like my like staple, or probably a lot of people's staple in Ohio, is just fishing slow with a shaky head. Um, whether it's release areas or obvious structures or whatever, but, um, yeah, just that grinder mentality. I wouldn't say that I'm a fast fisherman. Um, sometimes I'm pretty stubborn and can be pretty slow, but I also over like the last five or six plus years, I've, um, but I spent a lot of time on Lake St. Clair and some on Lake Erie and okay. I kind of have been starting to have like a better understanding of just smallmouth fishing. Um, so I really enjoy that, that, and like, I love burying my head in a garment and, uh, just looking for fish um yeah i i don't know if power fishing's my thing i don't know i feel like i'm all over the place um <laughs> one thing I, I don't know it's uh, uh, well i'm yeah. just saying i'm looking at the at the schedule so you start out st john's river and harris chain uh you been to either of those i've been to the harris chain once i've never been to the st john's i've spent a lot of time in florida my dad has a house in Florida, so I'm like familiar with Florida. Um, okay, so you know how that you I mean you kind of know how that works because if you've never been yeah. down to Florida, uh, that was my experience this first year, and it will blow your mind. Uh, Santee Cooper. Yeah, never been there. That will probably be a smash fest. I assume that's going to be like bed fishing so, or some sort of shallow water or something. Yeah, um, good thing is you can just run all over that place and find them. Yeah, <laughs> that's a deal. Yeah. Be careful, Chickamauga. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there a handful of times around that time of year. It can be good, but like I feel like that has a lot of like local knowledge to play because the lake's good in general, and then you get those local guys in there that like know the juice within the juice mm-hmm. and just abs- and just absolutely good at town and put out big weights. Lake um, Fork. And yeah, never been to Texas. Um, wow. I, I but then we got the the St. Lawrence River. 
So you, yeah. I mean, you've got a magic spot there already. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. Uh, if you're familiar with the smallmouth, Lake Oahe. Yeah, I've heard that place and, is massive. And then the Mississippi River and La Crosse, Wisconsin. So, yeah, a mixture of new fisheries. And also, I mean, considering how young you are and, and haven't been doing it for decades, a number of fisheries that I feel like you could be fairly comfortable with going into it to where it's not just how do I get from the boat launch to this cove. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it'll definitely be interesting. And it's kind of sometimes it's intimidating because a lot of those guys that have been on the elites for a couple of years, other top circuits have, have fished a lot of those bodies of water. And I haven't, I haven't fished any like a decent amount of those. So I don't know if that'll be at a disadvantage or an advantage because sometimes people like sometimes it's easy to fish history and sometimes history will hurt you. So I'm, I'm excited just to have an open mind and open game plan and just kind of roll with it. All right. What kind of boat do you have? Uh, this or interesting story about the boat. So earlier this year, back in May or April or May, uh, we had a ranger, um, like a family had a ranger and I was on my way to Douglas Lake for one of the Southern opens. And I was right outside of Knoxville and Knoxville, the highways down there, it's like everything comes together at once. It's kind of super chaotic, but I ended up getting rear ended by a semi. I, it wasn't my oh, fault. I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't hurt or anything like that, but it, it totaled the boat. I gripped the motor off. Like it did the the trailer detached from the truck and rolled into a the median wall, so the boat was totaled. So I went to I went down to Douglas Lake and I luckily uh, good buddy Ben Stacy he he let me uh, borrow his boat for the week, um, and then and then I, so I was out of a boat for about a month and then I ended up uh, contacting Weedas Marine there in Northern Kentucky and they hooked me up with a a Phoenix that I've been able to run the rest of this year and I, I really like the Phoenix but. Yeah, so that's been that was kind of my whole ordeal that I had to deal with this year, but luckily I was able to get through it. And then between events, you're going to continue to work like on the off weeks, or are you going in full time on this? I think I think unless I go down there and win the first tournament for some reason, I think I still got to keep this job and make a couple bucks. Um, Yeah, if I'm home for two or three weeks at a time, my boss is like cool enough where he'll let me come in and work and make a couple bucks because he understands what I'm doing and stuff. Wow. Well, man, I know uh, you got some fans out there now, Alex. I know a lot of the BTL fans probably pulling for you now. Yeah, yeah, I do have a lot of fans. There's a lot of people in Ohio. A lot of the kids um, that I grew up fishing the youth club with, there's a good group of us that are all about my age or a little bit younger, and they've they've really been like super supportive and always cheering for me, and they're kind of being able to like live through this whole journey uh, kind of with me, and then also my parents are – super supportive um they yeah. they're obviously the ones that got me into fishing and helped me out a lot and stuff like that but yeah it's right. it's really it's really cool to represent ohio because i feel like there's not a whole lot of us that have um yeah i'm only one of a few people that have from ohio mm-hmm. that are doing this so it's definitely yeah. cool to kind of bring that ohio ohio people with me yeah cool stuff so i guess i guess my last question then we'll let you get back to work is sponsorship wise what are you still looking for anything that you've kind of sewed up like what is your what, what are you still trying to uh to get on board for the 2022 season uh i still got a lot of work to do um so far i'm still in the process of it i still got to send send a lot of stuff out um i got a, a, a buddy that's helping me out do like kind of the business stuff i guess maybe like an agent would be the title for it um, but I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out and it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, it's a lot tougher than I would, than I thought it would be. I'm not sure if that's because of how young I am or because it's my first year doing this rookie season. Um, but it's definitely a lot tougher and I'm still, I'm still trying to work through things and kind of get the ball rolling on the, a- the sponsorship aspect mm-hmm. of things. And so, so what far, does Bass do? I mean, you've qualified. Like, do they? Do you get a call from the owner? Do they send you a packet on what's going on? Do they give you a timeline? Like, what has Bass done? Not. I mean, I'm just at. You know what I mean? Like, hey, you qualified. You're in the points. Is there like a whole system that they do, or is it just kind of like, hey, we'll see you in Florida in February? No, I re- I got an email a couple like about a week ago or something like that, just kind of giving like a description of when payment dates are due, and then also. Uh, we had there's like an anglers meeting that we're doing sometime in December uh, to get everybody together, um, but I'm excited to make relations with bass and meet new people and get my foot in the door and represent bass. All right, cool stuff, man. We'll uh, we'll let you get back to work, but uh, gonna be an exciting time for you. I know a lot of people 
uh, wish that they could trade places with you, but obviously well earned with your performance on the Northerns. And uh, we'll have you back on, man, when uh, the season kicks off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hopefully I'm on again. Hopefully it's for a, a good reason or something. Like, yeah. Hopefully, like, hopefully it's for a good reason. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. And I, 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 I'm just a 22-year-old out here trying to trying to figure out this whole professional fishing thing, I guess. Yeah. All right. Very cool, man. All right. Take care, dude. Thank you. I appreciate it. See you, Alex. Thank All right, you. See you, Alex. All right. Pretty honest dude right there. Yeah. Very honest. Yeah. And I mean, he obviously can make good decisions on the water. And that, I think, is very important. Uh, it was interesting that he said, you know, I went out and, you know, I caught him in three events. And the next thing I know, yeah, I'm in. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a great example of what the conversation that Ken Duke and I had about, well, how many years should you give these guys? Is it one and done? Should you give them two years? Uh, that kind of solidified the fact that, yeah, I think you need to give these guys two years. 100%. Rookies, you need to give them two years. I agree. I mean, he's kind of – he's a little – He's very green. Very green. But, but he, that could also work to his advantage. But he doesn't know anybody. No, we've it, seen that it, with it Derek have, Remitz. How old was Remitz when he came on? And Casey he was Ashley. In his young 20s. I mean, he's a dude from his young 20s who's traveling around, sod farmer from Minnesota, goes yeah. down to – you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and figures something out, too. Uh I mean, yeah. he finished in the top half. He did fish the uh, the Harris Chain um, this year in the Southerns. He finished 102nd at the Harris Chain, which was out of 230, so top half there. Then the top half at Douglas, he finished 74th. The weights were super stacked there, so he was only like a pound out of a check there. And then 70th uh, on Lake Norman. Um, so it's not like he ha has had, you know, had disastrous tournaments anyways. He also, on the Kissimmee Chain, his first one ever in 2020, finished 32nd. And he finished 40. First on lay. So, I mean, in, in this 10, he's only had his lowest finish is 129, and you're talking over 200 boats and most of the other. So, I mean, the guy can make good decisions and catch fish. He's got to catch him next year against a much, much tougher field, though. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, he's, I mean, that's the whole point of gotta, the deal. Got to cast checks. Make it in the opens to step that's up what to you the Elite do. Series. So. That's what you got to do. So, we wish him but well. But I like that he's going to continue to work. It sounds yeah. like he's got a, a job when he comes back in between. It's not like he has to make that hard decision like quit job, not quit job. Yeah. He's just kind of hanging out, man. Enjoying life. And sometimes that's what, I mean, we've, we've talked about it. Sometimes those are the guys that they have less strain financial family emotional business wise than yeah. the other guys so there's a lot less on their shoulders when they go out there it's hey man i'm on the elite series let's go catch them <laughs> would you not agree uh, no i agree it's not you know family's gone and i, I quit yeah. my job or i've got this business that i have to take care of while i'm gone like there's something to be said for that kind of young just go out you have one singular focus and that's it yeah we'll see we'll see all right we're gonna take a break come back wrap things up here on a monday everybody stay tuned we'll be right back I've made my living on the water for over 20 years. For 14 years. For over 23 years. I've worn a bunch of different clothing brands over the years. Some companies big. And some companies small. All of them said they were making clothing for us. But none of them knew us. None of them were us. Except for one. Except for one. Except one. AFCO. 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 Fishing isn't part of us. It is us. Everyone, Brandon Polnick here. People always be asking me what I got tied on. And I'm like, X-Zone Lures. And they're like, Brandon, why you got X-Zone Lures tied on? And I'm like, let me show you why. The bite. Hey. Get out of there. Get out of there. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's Get in here. Oh, God. Giant. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think you get the point. Pro-inspired, pro-designed, tested and proven by legends on the water, dominating the tournament trail for over 50 years.
everything you need, one legendary brand. Strike King. Hey guys, Major League Fishing Pro, Jacob Wheeler here with my new Signature Series line of rods with Ducket Fishing. We have my 7.2 cranking rod right here. Crankbaits can be very fickle and having the right, you know, having a lot of tip can be too much and having not enough tip can, you know, lose a lot of fish. So you really got to be careful. If there's one or two techniques that I'm really, really adamant about having the perfect action is a crankbait, especially like a square bill, a DT6. Um, you know, those medium running crankbaits in the springtime when those fish's mouth are pretty tough, that's when I'm really, really, really on top of having my actions just perfect. The Little John family of crankbaits designed by top tour pro John Cruz have excelled at catching bass in any condition for years. They all feature a flat-sided design and paint jobs that are seldom seen in mass production bait. The Little John family also expands with new rattling versions of the Little John 50 and Little John 50 MD. Both of these baits are proven fish catchers that will now be available in rattling versions for stained and muddy water. They feature the same great action and diving depths as the original 50 and MD sizes. The Ned Rig. What rod should I be using with the Ned Rig? My favorite is the Denali Lithium Multi-Spin Rod. It's our seven foot four length, great Ned Rig rod. It's got a great sensitive tip on it. It's long enough where I can make long casts, which you're usually fishing clear water with a Ned Rig, and it's got enough backbone to get those fish in. So check it out, Denali Lithium Series, seven foot four, multi-spin. Everybody loves to chase bass on the water. But is your most valuable asset protected when it's not on the water? Empire Covers can preserve your bass boat against even the harshest conditions. When the storm is coming, that bass boat needs to be protected. Check out EmpireCovers.com for all your cover needs. Empire Covers is the ultimate solution when it comes to protecting that asset. Empire Covers is the ultimate solution in easy protection for your truck, for your boat, for your car, anything that needs to be protected from the elements. BTL listeners can receive free shipping plus an extra 15% off their entire order on EmpireCovers.com. Just use the promo code BTL at checkout. Empire Covers, protect what you love. All right, we are back on a Monday, kicking off the week. And uh, you, you've got something there, Matthew, you want to talk about? You had something? No, I just a, a discussion point. What was it? You want to talk about it or you want to save it? No, we can talk about it. You think it's a valid discussion? I mean, do you think I, there's validity to it? I have no idea. I mean, we haven't really explored it. It just, I was just thinking like, so obviously I listened to the, uh, I listened to a lot of college football radio and yeah. stuff on the way in and stuff and they are always talking about style points and how the, t the <laughs> how the team is playing at that time and all this stuff uh. and then you know the rankings come out and you have have one lost teams ahead of undefeated teams not just oklahoma but i mean like you've got oregon behind or behind ohio state even though ohio state beat or or even the oregon it. beat I ohio yeah. and i started thinking what if we did angler of the year rankings like they do college football yeah. rankings to I, where not a fan style points for the win like down in Florida. Yeah, he had 30 pounds, but then look, he just hung on the last three days. So you don't give him <laughs> as much or or yeah, but did you see this guy sucked at the Sabine River, but that was a tough tournament and wasn't his style, but he's had three top tens to close out the year. So even though someone is technically ahead of him in the standings, he's fishing better. <laughs> he's a he's a higher he's a better angler right now. So he's more deserving of being ahead. Yeah. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, would that not be interesting if you had a room of, of, I, of uh, like a committee that ranked the anglers based on style points, based on margin <laughs> of victory, based on how they won and where they won? 
and that was how they ranked him instead of their actual finish. I I think that you could ex- it would be a disaster. You could excuse a zero because the water came up three foot on Pickwick, <laughs> and that's not his jam. And and you know we'll just throw that one out the window. I think it would be a great conversation piece, but the validity to it would be null and void. I mean, is that not what they're doing with college football? I get it, and, and I've always said there needs to be a playoff in college football. It needs to be uh, obviously not as big as the NCAA basketball tournament, but. For a group of people in a conference room to select four teams out of how many Division One teams are there? 130? Mm-hmm. And speculate and ponder. Well, you know, they didn't play that great against Kansas. And you got Oklahoma State over here who blew them out by 50. I, it, it just, it's like I say about fishing. All right? That's why poles and all this other stuff doesn't work in fishing because... It comes from your performance on the water, right? That's what matters. It's competing against each other on the same playing field, the same platform, and you can't compare apples and oranges. With football, throw eight teams in there, throw 12 teams. I don't know what the right number is, but but let them play. Don't, don't let a national champion come from the selection of only four teams out of 130. I mean, what if we just selected, hey, you know what, guys? We're just going to select these people over here in this conference room. We're just going to select four people to fish in the Bassmaster Classic. Based on? Based on whatever. Mm -hmm. What we feel in our minds would be the best four anglers to participate in the Bassmaster Classic based upon their performance. And anything else that we want to take into consideration, it, it, it will never work in fishing. It would never work. I know. I was just saying. It. But it's just a good a, discussion. It would be just a fun. Discussion. It would be fun to see what the results would be from those people in the room about professional bass fishing. Mm-hmm. You know, they kind of did that with the greatest angler of all time. You remember what was it? Ten years ago, they did that. Oh, I think that was longer than ten years. Ten, ago. fifteen years ago, Ken Duke was involved with that. I think Terry Brown was involved with that. Uh, uh, what's his name? One of the greatest media people in the history of the sport. Uh, unfortunately, passed away Tim early. Tim Tucker? Tim Tucker in an automobile accident in Florida. Mm-hmm. I think he was involved in that. Uh, but good discussion piece, but the validity to it just wouldn't exist. Wouldn't exist. What do you think about the question and how he responded about it would be much better if I had more time from the business side to be able to prepare to fish at the highest level at bass. Yeah, that's something that you've talked about a long time. Um, I thought you were going to go down the uh, like seminar route with him. No, no, no. That. He I needs thought, it. Yeah. The, does he need it? Yeah, well, I, I think mean, he does. A lot of guys need it. I need it. Everyone needs it. There's no one that wouldn't benefit from it except yeah. maybe like a couple of guys who have it figured out in the industry but i thought that's where you were going uh, no. with that question as opposed to the more but he answered it exactly the issue that you have brought up and other anglers have brought up over the years is you you qualify and just based on the way the open season works your window for all intents and purposes especially if it's in the centrals or, or one of the divisions that ends last your window for securing meaningful sponsorship to be able to then perform without financial constraint on you is closed already. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's either start having something in place as the year progresses, knowing that the percentage chances are that you're not going to make it, but that like, but then how did, does that, does that company then like save money back? Some until, do. And if so, so like technically you need to have to be like, listen, if I make the elite series, is this money saved for me? So you know what you're stepping into. Yeah. That's really hard to do. And it to have is. a relationship with a organization or company that you can approach them to say, hey, I don't want you to sponsor me now, but I want you to not sponsor current Elite Series guys that you know <laughs> are going to be on the Elite Series in the chance that I make it in this one-off two-day tournament in October. Yeah. But yeah, that window's already closed because their budget's already set. And it's a really easy out for a company to go, yeah. hey, man, sorry, our budget's already set. Instead of to really take a hard look and see how, how it benefits. But think if you had that benefit to go into ICAST and be a part of ICAST, knowing that in 2023, 
you're going to be part of the Elite Series, and you have six months, basically, mm -hmm. to put your portfolio of sponsors together, get your boat wrap set up, get all the business side of it. It gives you six months to really dial that in. I 100% agree that would be it. It's also, though... There's also, I mean, are there enough people that follow it though to where you kind of keep the momentum going where you're fishing throughout the year, you qualify for it, you're building momentum and then I don't you think start so and the then opens. people follow you or is it like, hey, you do it and then you have this whole season and everything happens and then all of a sudden you're there and no one knows who the heck you are and then you're like, oh yeah, remember I caught him a year ago back here and, mm -hmm. and it's like this weird crossover thing then. I think it's harder to keep the momentum rolling. Uh -huh. I don't think so. I think uh, the following is very friends and family. In the opens, yeah, you have some hardcore fans out there that follow, mm -hmm. but most of the time, it's interest in a local guy who they want to see make it. Yeah. Agree or disagree? Yeah, I think for the majority of guys, it would benefit. For a guy like Peroznik, he'd just have to sit there and twiddle his thumbs for six months. <laughs> you know, it's, that's, that doesn't help him out. You know what I mean? You're still going to have events out there that he could yeah. probably dive into, but I think to give these guys every opportunity to be successful, mm -hmm. I think that is one of the changes that definitely needs to be made from a business perspective. It is a massive investment. No, I agree. Like back to put a bow on the yeah. the college rankings thing. Like Zaldane's yeah. the perfect example. I was scrolling through guys trying to find it, right? So like Zaldane just barely slides into the classic. He starts the year with a 79th, a 94th, a 34th, and a, a 31st and a 62nd, right? Yeah. So like he's way out. But then the second half of the year, out of the last five, he has three top five finishes. So, like, if you're sitting in there in that committee room and stuff, you're going, okay, Zaldane is way above 40th because right now, look, he's one of the hottest guys finishing. He's yeah. finished 60% of the second half of the season in the top five. <laughs> so, instead of 40th, like, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, now you're ranking him way up, and then, like, uh, a guy like uh, Kyle Welcher, who starts the year with one, two, three, four, five six seven top 40s but then finishes the year with it two eighty fifths out of like 94 guys mm. now all of a sudden you're going oh well, he fell down so now you're dropping him down even though his points are above zaldane and they're 20 you see what i'm saying like now you're talking about who's fishing hot at this time and who's it's it all about what have you done lately yeah which they is even, what they're doing with i know the college they talk football about teams. that there was like oh yeah you know those first couple of games that doesn't really matter. It's what you, you know. Does what this you guy do deserve November? to be in the classic? He barely hung on. <laughs> well, this guy, look, this guy could win it. He's had three top fives out of his last five. It would be a cool discussion topic to get a, you know, five or six guys in a room and just put a camera up there with mics in front of them and go, all right, guys, let's hash this out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got your uh, you got your your Georgias now, like a Seth Fighter who was just dominant throughout the entire season. Wheeler. Yeah, Wheeler, those type of things. I, I just have the the bass, but yeah, you could do but the you, exact same. You thing can't. Over that's there. that's the point that I made earlier. It's apples and oranges, mm -hmm. dude. Well, this guy broke yeah. down in this one, or he <laughs> lost that fish. You know, if that receiver doesn't pass, if this bad, oh uh, well, if this bad, John ball Jones doesn't. tore his ACL. I'm just and, saying uh, they've rallied back with this new guy at quarterback. Yeah, I I that would, like I said, it would be a good discussion topic, but. Not going to fly. You know, do you put the Johnson, uh, Johnston brothers that high because they were supposed to dominate up north? They were supposed to win and have top fives you at think they the had St. More Lawrence pressure? and Champlain and all that. Do you think they had more pressure on them during the events? Do you think there was self-imposed pressure? I honestly do not think they feel any pressure up there. I think they, uh, on, Thousand, or on Thousand Islands and up north, I think they chuckle at people who think they can compete <laughs> with them. Not in a bad way, just in, I mean, I just don't think that there's any stress. They don't care, man. No, I think they know they're going to go out and they're going to catch them better than anyone else out there. And it does happen. Yeah, I, that, there's no, I do not think they feel any pressure. Yeah. More so than like a guy on, on TVA Lakes or something where you're going to have a lot more uncontrollable variables going down, yeah. right? Like, they know where they live. It's just a matter of, like, do you lose one or All right, look at this. can you get there? Our friend Matt Ellis put this up there. Mark, Matt, planning for next year during July could be too soon for companies who know their budget. A lot of companies begin budget planning in August through October. I agree with that. But they don't qualify until middle of October. That's what I'm saying. Like, if I had made it at Grand, that was, like, last week. And now I call and it's November first and it's only been a week after that tournament the point i was trying to make about july is you at least get that introduction to say hey i've qualified for the bassmaster elite series let me tell you a little bit about me i know you're getting ready to go into your budget discussions in august september october what it is 
I would really appreciate if you would consider me to be a part of your staff. You get that introduction in July. I mean, you're not going to walk into uh, a major player unless you have some type of connection there and and do a spill, and then they go, yeah, here, so in we've got a contract theory, for you. Sign right in here. In theory, if you're, if you're trying to set yourself up for this correctly and you're going to fish all nine of the Bassmaster Opens and you do not have a pathway or whatever line lined out yeah. and you're not with companies do you do you send them things at the beginning of the year saying hey uh i'm not really asking for a deal right now but here is my plan here is what i'm going to do if i perform if mm -hmm. i can show you the whiff them i would like to make contact with you midway through the year to see where i'm standing because I know when you guys do your budgets and I still feel like I could be valuable and you go back mid through year, you're like, hey, I'm in eighth in the centrals. I'm in fifth in the overall. Like this is, I would love to have actually maybe talk to someone to, to get a little bit more on the table. Yeah. And then as you go into the last ones before it, now you're talking August, September, you're like, look, it, it's a very good possibility that I'm going to make the Elite Series. I know you have this budget. So now you've got six months. They've kind, you've kind of been on their table for it if those companies are, are, are smart and looking at it. And you're building your brand throughout it. And then you say, hey, if it goes down in this tournament, can we have a deal? So then you're you're getting ahead of that ball. Or is that something that just is like, is it too cocky? I is don't it think so. Too assumptions? I, I, it, will, the, will the, would the companies even have anything to do? Because that's what you're saying needs to happen in the current format. No, once you qualify, you know. You know whether or not you're Right, in. but what I'm saying is you're saying you have to freaking have a game plan before you qualify you, you can't just go to that company and say hey i qualify I you can so. but it's all right bottle of truth serum right here i would like to take this bottle and have you know obviously i'll have multiple bottles of truth serum and give decision makers and that's the important thing not somebody that filters all of the requests for everybody out there the decision makers and ask them one question right now I would ask them. Wait, decision makers who sign, who say yes, this guy for here, this much. I've got for a this contract season. here. We want you to be part of our staff. Okay. Give them the truth serum right now. I wonder how many of those people, if we had ten people drink the truth serum, know who Alex Redwine is right now. I know several of them do. Out of ten, how many do you think know? Probably four or five. Less than half. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, but. Now, if you change that scenario to where you but, know But I will say that there are some that, that know who he is because Alex has taken the steps of saying, hey, I don't, has reached out to some people and said, yeah. hey, I'm not exactly sure how this works, blah, blah, blah. What do I need to do? And that's the only reason why. If he had just stayed, communication. In, if he had just stayed in his little compartment and not done anything and tried yeah. to, I would say zero or maybe one or two, the guys who follow the Oakland would be it. the only one. I get it. But what I'm saying is, if you knew at the end of the month of July or the month of June or whatever it is going into ICAST, now you can have that dialogue, even if it is with what I classify the gatekeeper, mm -hmm. and say, look, I've qualified for the Elite Series. I'm putting together my portfolio. My name is Alex Redwine. This is what I've done. This is what I can do for you and your brand. That's your and big that's thing really for important. 15 years, the whiff them. You got to have the whiff them, man. What's in it for me? What's in it for the company to have John Smith be a part of that staff, and how is that going to generate revenue for that company? Let me ask you this, Mark. Out of the major companies that are out there, even the smaller companies who have pro staffs, guys on tours, I'm talking BPT and Bassmaster Elite Series. Yeah. How many of them are 100% happy not looking to add anybody? Man, we've got our deal. It's working fine. We're just status quo going into it. And what percentage are always looking to add new blood? I think that that has changed. I think it has changed over time. I think 20, 25 years ago, the way that you approach your staff and how your staff is engaged with your brand is totally different than the way it is today. I think some companies out there are satisfied with what they have and they don't want to churn out the people that they have on their pro staff. I would just say no one's going to drink your true serum if it's sparkling water, <laughs> peach honey, or it's that diet green tea Diet stuff. green tea, baby. No one would touch that. No. Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a great conversation to have. It's something that, that I, I really believe it's needed to help these guys out. I mean, I wish 
Alex, all the best in the world. But, dude, he's climbing up the mountain. And he knows it. He is climbing up the mountain. But also, at some point, like, Brandon Polinick was climbing up the mountain. Jacob Wheeler was climbing up the mountain. And and what do... Jordan Lee was climbing okay, up the mountain. Okay, what do those three names have in common, though? They reached the top pretty dang quick. They won. Yes. They yes. won. And, now, there's and no saying that Alex changed. isn't going to go out and win. No, I didn't say that. Right. But winning changes 100%, things. hundred percent. Because if you look at super early in the career guys, Derek Remitz, win. Casey Ashley, win. Dustin Connell, win. Jesse Wiggins, win. Skeet Reese, win. win. KVD, win. Edwin Winning Evers, win. Changes everything. A key win early in the career. And I, I think if you ask them, there's a lot of guys who say, man, without that win, I wouldn't be. Justin Lucas, win. I mean, you guys, Bodie, won co angler stuff as, uh, on that. He got it all. Yeah. Like all these guys, uh, uh, I guess the only one that really comes to my mind. Would be Josh Bertrand. And remember, he almost won that open uh, in 2012, 2013 Mm -hmm. on Lake Louisville. But it took him a long time, not a long time, five, six years to get that first win. And I would say he's a kind of a top end established pro now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Winning changes things, man. And and, uh, if he goes out and, and he wins his very first Elite Series event, Everybody's going to know who Alex Red, Redwine is. What are you supposed to do if you're in his position, though? What are you supposed to do if you know how difficult it is to make it and it's you simple. go out and you tie in the points with Mike Iconelli and you get your Elite Series invitation That's and a simple you just answer, turned dude. 22 years old? It's a simple answer. All right? You go do it. And, and you have to put the skin in the game and the sweat equity to make it happen because this is the career path that you have chosen of which this is what you want to do. So you have to do it. Now, where people get in trouble in this game is they go out, they try it for two, three years, they do not have any success, Mm -hmm. they lose a ton of money, and they continue to try and do it rather than walk away and go, you know what, I've tried this for three or four years, I'm $160,000 in debt, I need to go find a real job. Right, but I mean... These 22-year-olds could go do it for two years, be $60,000 in debt, and they're only 23. It doesn't matter. You can't. It doesn't matter what your age is. Debt is debt. You have to pay that money back. Do you not feel... uh, This is just me asking you questions now. This is just me asking you questions. Yeah. Do you feel like it's easier to take bigger risks when you're younger? Yes. Yeah, because you have the opportunity... I mean, let's face it. If if he goes out, he's twenty. What is he? Twenty two. Yeah, he's twenty two years old. He goes out for three years. He loses a hundred and twenty grand. You know, over three years, he still has an opportunity to go back and either learn a trade or, uh, you know, go back to college, get a degree, and continue on a career path that he enjoys to do without being forty, forty five years old. So I think the risk. The risk level is much higher, and it's that way for everybody, but I think the opportunity to recover from the debt that you have incurred is much more advantageous if you're younger than somebody who's 35 to 45 trying to do it. But do you not put any value in the life experience experience and growing up and learning the life lessons albeit so you're looking at you you keep saying losing money is there not a point where you're not losing money where even if you are not profitable you are still investing in yourself that's going to change your entire future based on these experiences that you've had in your young to mid 20s that might set you up for success greater, whether it be in the industry or out of the industry, relationships, dealing with superiors, sponsorship, expectation of others, believing in yourself, traveling on the road, dealing with money, learning the actual cost of things that yeah. even though you might be 60, 70,000 after this, you have that experience. You fish the Bassmaster Elite Series. That's something that only a couple hundred people can actually say. No, I get that. And if you do it correctly, even if you lose the money, you set yourself up physically, 
and, and emotionally for success in the future based on those experiences that you technically failed at when you were in your young 20s. I agree 100%. All right, okay. I don't disagree with that. Now, you need to realize this, Matt. There are thousands, there are hundreds of thousands of businesses out there that probably lose money the first five years that they're in operation. But what they do is they have a financial plan and, and funding in place to where when that equity... That sweat equity has taken place the first five years of which they still believe in that business. They still have enough revenue and resources to cover the experience that they have learned over that previous five right. years. Now, if that doesn't happen, you know what ends up happening? They file bankruptcy and they go out of business. Right. So how is this any different than a young 21, 22-year-old who wants to be an entrepreneur? And he comes up with this idea for some sort of product, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, man, I'd like to do this product. He's never owned his own business. He doesn't have it. People are like, dude, that's a, that's a great product. You should try to get some investors for it and stuff. And he goes and pitches it. And the first guy he pitches it to says, yeah, I'm in. Mm -hmm. And he goes, holy cow, I didn't expect it to go like that. Like, is that not the same situation? In now? a way. But, but he better have, just like what I have said for a zillion years on this show, if you're going to make the move to the Bassmaster Elite Series, you better have a backup plan. You better have a backup plan to where if you are not successful, and everybody out there hopes that you're successful, but from a monetary, from a fiscal responsibility when it comes to money, you better have a backup plan if you fail. All right? Part of that plan is saying, you know, I'm going to give this five years. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give this six years. But I know that I have a plan to either repay the debt or generate revenue to where if I get toward the end of this adventure and I just am not performing at the level to make it profitable, then I have a plan in place to absorb the cost and the, and the loss of revenue that I incurred those five years. This is super interesting, and we do this every once in a while. I know we have to wrap it up because you yeah. have to get to class. But yeah. We talk about like longevity and all this stuff. And obviously, I think the average person I read recently will go through four different careers in their yeah. life span. But remember when the Elite Series came out, it had been, what, 2006? So you're 15 years ago, which mm -hmm. is a long time, but also is not that long ago. Would you agree? I, I, I can see that. I'm going to start from yeah. the bottom. We're going to see how many of these guys 15 years later are still making a living doing this. So you pulled up the Elite Series list from 2006. 2006. This okay. is the Angler of the Year standings for 2006, the first year of the Elite Series. It featured, uh, I believe, 10 regular season tournaments, four no-entry fee, $250,000 uh, majors. Yeah. Um, 100000 to win, a lot of TV coverage, the ESPN outdoors block, the whole nine yards. This was the year of the Godzilla ain't got nothing on me. This yeah. was Preston Clark with the 100 pounds on Santa. This was the whole deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Dustin Wilkes, still making a career 100% in the industry. Designing television a lot, show. Television show, designing a lot of lures. Kind of got an Uncle Frank. But walked away on. from the tournament yeah. scene. Conrad Piku. Nothing. <laughs> I didn't plan this. Robert Hamilton Jr., uh, we don't want to go. To, watch 20 feet deep if you're interested in Robert Hamilton Jr., okay? Randy Yarnell. Nothing. Brooks Rogers. Uh, nothing. Jimmy Houston. That we're aware of. These guys might still be fishing yeah. locally. Jimmy but Houston. He's Jimmy Houston. Yeah, it's Jimmy. Outlier. Rick yeah. Ash. Nothing. Mark Rogers. Uh, nothing. Ken Broder. Nothing. Bink DeSaro. Nothing. Terry Seagraves. Nothing. Doc Merkin. Charlie Weir. No. Mark uh, Joe Thomas. Still doing it. Yeah, but he's UMF. one of those guys who did. Yeah. Who who drew? Uh, Vince Her Hurtado. Nothing. Mike O'Shea. He's still doing some stuff on the West Coast. I think. Dave Gleeby. Uh, working in a Bass Pro Shops. Bradley Stringer. Uh, still fishing. Grant local Goldbach. stuff. Who knows? With Jared Grant. Edwards. Uh, successful television show on the West Coast. Fire and Velvet. Uh, In and out. Hit or miss. Yeah, I mean, he still fishes uh, the U.S. Open. Guy Eaker. Still fishing. But there's not a single one of these guys that are still on the Elite, Elite series. series. No. Charlie Hartley. Still fishing. Open. Successful. And, uh, very profitable business uh, that he runs. Pond, still fishing. Kurt Dove. 
what's he got? Kurt Dove, Hayabusa Hooks, Bass Edge Radio. Still in the industry. Still fishing. the. But I'm saying, these guys that are still around, look at what they've got. They have other things. They have other things in the industry. We're still not to anybody who's still 15 years fishing the Bassmaster Elite Series. Yeah. Rick Morris, he just retired. He was, but he was back and forth. But he also had a rod company. Yeah. Uh, Dave Smith, uh, retired. Uh, One of of the richest people in the state of Oklahoma. Mike Reynolds. Mike Reynolds, uh, still doing stuff on the West Coast. We don't have a single BPT guy yet. No. We don't have a single Elite Series guy yet. No. And we're up into the 70s, folks. Wow. From the original list of the Elite Series. All right. We're about to get to some, though. <laughs> one. But well, it's, when it, we get to one, we'll stop. But we're, no, because we're getting to another one, and it's the same thing that's going on. So, uh, Mike Reynolds, Preston Clark, Charlie Youngers, 76, Britt Myers. What does Britt do? Britt works his tail off at Britt Myers automotive store yeah like literally goes from the That's tournament main to the store income, like he's known for working 100 hours a week and then going and fishing tournaments yeah paul Horoski. uh he's a pharmacist yeah i think so El- yeah. elton loose uh ken cook who who passed, passed away. away keith phillips i have no idea uh kevin langell no idea 70th frank scalish Dude's still in the industry, but what does he have going uh, on, Mark? He's got day four, baby. No, no. but what is he's got? <laughs> no, he's very successful in doing the lure stuff that he does right. for companies. And, and now you get to. You got Fred Rambanis, Mark Menendez, Kevin Short, Jamie Fralick, you know. Yeah. And, and, and then, it, you know, now you start getting some more. But, dude, you're talking about 70, 80, 90, 100, 40, the bottom 45 guys. What are, what are the two things they all have in common? Those guys struggled to win. Yeah. And the ones that, that were down there that are still I- industry names, yeah, dual, triple, tons of different revenue streams, not yeah. just on fishing. Yeah. No, that's a great point, great analogy. And it was cool to go through that. A lot of names from the past. Yeah. That one that we were trying to figure out, is Mark Kyle on that? And Mark Kyle's not on that list, is he? Uh, it was a year before. He might be higher. I mean, there's some crazy yeah. ones that got above there. I mean, there's a... Uh, like a John Bondy, he's still around, but dude, the guy's like the king of musky fishing yeah. with Bondy baits and the Bondy blade, and he's making a ton. Uh, just, just interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. But hey, man, I wish the dude nothing but success. And I'll tell you this much: everybody will know who Alex Redwine is if he goes out mm-hmm. and he wins his very. Like first I said, you want to do the opposite? Go to the the top. Number one was Mike Iaconelli. Number two was Steve Kennedy. Number three was Kevin Van Dam. Number four was Aaron. Number five was Dean. Number six was Kevin Worth, who retired. Yeah. Uh, number seven, Skeet. Number eight, Edwin. Nine, Tommy. And ten, Kelly Jordan. All right, stop there. What do all those guys have in common? They win. They win. And they're still fishing. Yeah. It's all about winning. It really is. And if you, if you win, things are going to happen for you from a, from a sponsorship standpoint. But uh, really good feedback from people on the comments on YouTube and over on BassZone.com. And uh, we got to wrap things up, but I want to thank Alex Redwine for coming on the show. Kind of eye-opening for somebody that's getting ready to dive into a life-changing event. That's good. He's going to have a lot of good stories. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, man, you go to a lot of places where a lot of these guys who got in it when they were 20, and I've talked about it, and I'll wrap this up in 20 seconds. But like I said, you're Justin Lucas's, you're... Brandon Polinix, the young guys, even the Seth Fighters, when they first started, it wasn't a no information rule as soon as everything went off limits. Yeah. They had a 30 day information rule. So, like when they went to a Santee Cooper 30 days before, they could talk to someone about how to get a lot around, where the productive areas are, where all this is. And now you've got a knowledge base where you've got these guys who have been there and know how to get around. You get an Alex Redwine, wasn't really expecting to do it this year like it now he qualifies now it's immediately off limits for him even though the tournaments are months away he doesn't have that 30 days off limits the only people he can talk to are his fellow competitors who have no skin in the game to give him juice so now he's got to (laughs) doubly doubly figure out how to beat these guys on stuff where where they have had information for 10 years been able to get information and fished it recently without the off limits and now it's like hey dude pay your entry fees figure out how to get across the lake I get it, man. Is that a valid point? It's a valid point. It's a good valid show point. today. Good show today. Good way to kick off the Who week. Who we got? We got Jay Shakura. Uh, Jay Shakurat on tomorrow. Another 22-year-old. I believe he's from Wisconsin. 
And then we'll wrap up the week with Jacob Fouts, who I guess is the elder statesman out of the young 20-year-olds. There's mm. also a 24- and 26-year-old who qualified. I figured they were too old for the Young Guns <laughs> week. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Everybody out there, be safe. That's it. We're out of here.